<coughs> Welcome everyone, this is CSIS 3020, Web Programming and Design. This is the fifth week, this is the second video lecture. Okay, so what I was saying, last week we covered Chapter 6, Introduction to JavaScript, 7 and 8, which were the control statements, if, switch, while loops, all that stuff, JavaScript. Functions, how to declare functions, parameters, scope of the, of the variables, etc., etc. And then we, that's it. That's what we did, 6, 7, 8, and 9. This week, we got to cover 10, 11, 12, and 13. And if I don't cover everything in that it's in these four chapters, I need you to read them from the book in much more detail. So let's go very quickly through each one of these. Arrays. Arrays is probably one of the most important data structures in JavaScript because it's going to allow you to manipulate a whole bunch of data. Now, you guys remember that JavaScript is typeless? What does that mean, typeless? Anybody? When you declare a variable, that variable can hold any value. It can hold a string, an integer, a boolean, an object, a date, uh, whatever. Okay? It's typeless. And I think, I believe I... You know, I told you about, you know, it gives you more freedom, but it also gives you more responsibility when you program. So, how do you do, how do you declare variables? I mean, not variables, arrays. An array holds in bucket, one bucket, several types of values. Okay? So, let's take a look at how you declare an array. This is one way of doing it. New array. I believe I went through some samples in here when we created a new date, remember? And date was one of those important objects in JavaScript. Array is also a class in JavaScript. And I believe I also mentioned when I um, cover a little bit about document and window, if you guys remember, when you call document, you didn't have to create a new document. And when you called window, you didn't have to create a new window. But when you wanted a date, you had to create a new date. In this case, when you want an array, you want to have to create a new array. The reason why you do not have to do that with document and window, which are also JavaScript objects, it's because they're already created for you by the browser. The browser, when it loads the whole page, it already creates a document object and a window object for you. So you can play with it. Okay? Now you can create a new window, but you wouldn't do it this way. You would just say window open, and it will open another window. Okay? So those are objects that are already created for you. You don't have to do a new. But arrays... You do have to create them. In fact, one of the first ways that you create an array is by passing a number to the constructor. And that number is going to be the size of the array that you want. In this case, it's creating a five-element array. And it's zero-based. What does that mean? That the index starts counting from zero. So the only values, the only positional values that are valid for this array of five positions is sub 0, sub 1, sub 2, sub 3, sub 4. That's it. If you try to index in the sub 6, it's going to give you an error and say, eh, can't do that. Okay? And negative numbers are not allowed, obviously. Now, what you save in the N1 sub 0, could be a totally different type of object, type of value than when you save in n1 sub 1. Okay? And that's the whole idea about arrays, that you can manipulate a whole bunch of values and types in within one array. This is another one. New array. When you don't indicate the size, it will allocate an empty array, which you can later on 
resize it however you want. It. <coughs> so what are we doing here? We're basically putting into the array the N1 array. Notice this is the one this is the one array that we declare as five element array. And then in square brackets you indicate the index of that array that you want to put the value into. So when i equals 0 initially, you put in the first value in n1 sub 0. And what are you putting in there? The same index. So in n sub 0, you put in 0. In n sub 1, you put in a 1. In n sub 2, you put in a 2. And you get the point. So let's see it running. That's it. Now the second one, you're actually putting in i times i, right? That's why you can see that in the sub two, put in a four, sub three, you put in a nine, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. Any questions about arrays? Ah, you want to know how I put it in a table, right? Here it is. I created a heading. I created a table with a style border, right? A table heading. What does the heading say? Subscript. And then the other heading says value. That's how you're getting this. Subscript and value. So I am generating the HTML out of JavaScript statements. All I'm doing is I'm writing to the document. Document dot write line table tag. Now notice how I am building notice how I am building each one of the table rows. I'm going inside a for loop. And I'm creating, okay, table row, first table data. What is it going to be? The index. And the table data, start another table data. What is it going to be the next one? The array, sub i. Okay, now what is the array? Anybody? What is the array? It's a parameter. So arrays can be passed around between functions like like you pass around a variable, any other variable. So what do you do here in the array as a parameter? You're calling output array with that array. Oh, but I'm outputting two arrays. In fact, I'm calling that output array function twice. The first one with n1 and the second one with N2. So in one function, passing different arrays, I'm taking care of presenting these two. Get it? All right. Let's move on. How do you initialize an array? In fact, you can declare and initialize it, or you can just initialize it in one shot. Look at this. Right here, you're declaring a new array. But you're not telling it how many elements you want, like you did in the first one. In fact, you are implying it. How? By giving the actual values that are going to be stored in there, comma delimited. Notice that you're saying the first position in my array is going to be the string cyan. The second one magenta. The third one yellow. The, the, the fourth one is going to be black. Four elements. 
So you can say color sub zero, color sub one, color sub two, color sub three. That's it. Now, how about this one? This is another way of doing it. Integers. It's going to be an array, and you just initialize it right there between square brackets. First integer will be a two, second will be a four, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Look at that one, integers two. You're putting values on the first and last positions, and you're putting any values in the middle. They're going to be null, not a number. Okay? And then what do you do? You use the same output array, right? Function. And then you call upper array colors, upper array integers. You want to see what it renders? This is what it renders. The colors, the integers. Notice the second and, and third position on the on the second on the last array. Undefined. You never define a value in there. What will happen if you say hello? And save it. Exactly what I just told you, an array can save any type of value. Very powerful, but very dangerous. <laughs> because when you want to declare an array and initialize it, this is how you do it. The square brackets. So there's what, three or four different ways of creating an array? And initializing at the same time. Okay. This one is pretty dumb. I mean, look at this array sub i, and you just add it to a total and display the total. You guys know stuff. This one is interesting. You guys remember a week ago I showed you a sample on rolling the die? And a die could plan in any number between 1 and 6, right? So I, I use six variables. One called frequency 1, frequency, uh, and another one called frequency 2. And, two. and I'll keep track of how many times 1 fell, 2 fell, 3 fell, etc. And just counter, updated the counter, the frequency counter. Well, instead of using separate variables, this is the same example, but now we're using an array. So we have an array called frequency. We skip the first. We're not interested in the sub zero, right? So we don't put any values. And then we put zeros on the sub one through sub six. And then we do our math thing, right? Remember, we generate a, math, a random number between zero and one. And then we convert it into a number between 1 and 6, right? We take the math floor, and we, that's the phase value. Bless you. So the phase value could be anywhere between 1 and 6. And then what do we do? We use that phase value as the index into the array and update the frequency. So we're adding 1 to the frequency array in this position. So if it landed in 2, I'm adding 1 to the counter of 2s. And I'm doing this 6,000 times. So remember, probability says that almost uh, they should all be very similar, 1, 6. So in other words, one sixth of 6,000 is 1,000 times. 
So let's see if that's true. I'm going to roll a die. Very close. 1,058 times, number one. We're going to roll the die again. Now number five fell 1,042 times. Okay. All right. Uh, look at this one. You guys remember this one? Every time that I refresh, a new picture will come up. Remember, we did the same thing. We generated a number between 1 and 6, and then what we did is, if it landed in 1, we appended a dot .gif, and so we will load into the page an image called one dot .gif. Well, in this case, I don't have a one dot .gif or a two dot .gif. I have a CPE dot .gif. Okay. And I had an APT dot .gif. So what I do to associate the numbers between 1 to 6 and the names of those GIFs? We save them in an array. How do I do that? I create an array of pictures and initialize the name of the images. Sub 0 is CPE. Sub 1 Sub 1 is EPT. So, so how many are there? There are 7. So what I do, I generate a random number between 0 and 7. Notice that I don't have the 1 plus anymore here, right? If I had a 1 plus here, then I will have to start by 1 position and ignore the 0 position. So I'm generating a number between 0 and, and 7, I'm sorry, between 0 and 6, not including 7, right? I'm doing the floor, the math floor. And then I'm appending, okay, so I'm generating that number right here, and that's my index into the pictures array. So pictures of 0 will pick CPE. And I take I take that CP value and append it to that GIF. And that's what I'm gonna show. I'm gonna show the CPE that GIF. Okay. Pass array. That's also a very dumb sample. Sort. Look at this, this is really cool. Because you can actually create an array and just by calling a function of the array object, you can sort the whole thing. Look at this, you initialize this array. 10 numbers, one through 10, right? And what do you do? You output the array. Right before you're gonna sort it. Then what do you do? You say, hey, A, sort yourself. And then what you do is, obviously you are going to add a function of how to compare them. So the idea is, in your case, you're ordering what? You're sorting numbers. So you're going to have to provide some kind of function that knows how to compare numbers. And that function is called compare, in, compare integers. So given two integers, what do you do? You parse in the first one, and then you subtract from the second one. What are the options here? What are the options here? Let's, let's, give, let's do an example. Value 1 is 1. Value 2 is 2. You do mi 1 minus 2. Is that a negative number? Yes. That means that 1 is less than 2. Now let's pass it around. Suppose that value 1 is 2 and value 2 is 1. 2 minus 1, is it positive or negative or 0? Positive. That means 2 is greater than 1. 
Now let's do the last sample. Value 1 is 2, and value 2 is 2. 2 minus 2, how much is it? 0. That means that neither one of them is greater than the other. They're equal. And that's what you do. You pass a comparison function. This gives you the freedom of passing any comparison function that you want, which in string, it will be different. What will be the comparison between two strings? They're alphabetical letters. Right? If one starts with lowercase a and the other one with lowercase b, lowercase a will be less than lowercase b. So you return a negative number. Okay? So that's basically what you pass as the comparison, f com the comparative function of that sort. So what is it going to do? It's going to sort that array based on that, on, on that function. It's a pretty clever doing it. Now, this is probably the first time that you see this. What kind of parameter are we passing to this function? Another function. And that's one of the really cool things about JavaScript. And you're going to see that when you take a look at more complex samples. In fact, your JavaScript menus that I want you to think about, that you're going to be implementing for next week, should use something like this. You should be able to pass whole functions as parameters so that the function that you're passing it to can use it and call it. So let's do it. Here it is. The array before we sorted it and the array we, when we sorted it out. Now, that's assuming that you want it in ascending order. What will be the changes that you will have to do if you need it in descending order? Anybody? If value 1 is less than value 2, and I need this to be a negative number, to be in ascending number, exactly. How about if I just switch them? So now negative means the opposite. Means what? That this guy is greater than that one. Right? So if I refresh the page, now we're sorting them in descending order. questions okay <coughs> if you still have any questions I suggest you go to W3 schools and you're gonna see all the objects that I've been talking about the array object, the boolean object, the date object, the math object, all these objects that we are talking about since last week. Okay? And that uh, we will be talking the next half an hour or so. And take a look at them. Go into the array object. Okay? Go into the sort. And it will give you an explanation, an example. In fact, several samples of try it yourself. Play with it. Okay? Play with it. All right, let's move on. Linear search, very similar to desktop. Binary search, another type of algorithm. Init arrays. Um, this is well, this is multidimensional arrays. Who says that I cannot have 
as the first element of, an ar of my array, another array. Why not? Right? Well, welcome to multidimensional arrays. Notice that this array 1, its first element, remember, it's whatever you put right before that first comma, that's the first element. What do you have as your first element? Another array. In fact, you have an array of three numbers. One, two, three. And then your second element is in another array of elements, four, five, and six. Do they have to be the same dimension? No, they can be anything. In fact, look at array two. Array two has in the first position an array of two positions. And the second one has an array of one position. And then an array of three positions. Okay. How would you address the elements of multidimensional arrays? Very simple. You pass two dimensions in the case of two dimensional arrays, three dimensions in the case of three dimensional arrays, and so on and so forth. So I will be the index of the big one. The one outside, which in this case can only address what? Zero or one. Right? You guys see that? Array one is an array of two positions, sub zero and sub one. And then the second index will be the one for the specific array. So in this case, if index i is equal to 0, we're talking about this element. And if j is equal to 0, then we're talking about this element. 0, 0. This one will be 0, 1, 0, 2. 1, 0, 1, 1, and you get the point. All right. Any questions about arrays? Look at this one. A quiz. Select the name of the tip that goes with the image shown. I think that was called an EPT or something, like error prevention tip. No, that's a common programming error. I can't remember. I'm going to select this, submit. Yes, answer is correct. Please try again. Now, if I select something else, say, congratulations, your answer is correct. Oh, so it was an error prevention tip. Your answer is incorrect. Please try again. So how do you accomplish that? Doing a quiz. You're shown an image and you're given several input radio buttons, right? Now remember, radio buttons, in order for radio buttons to behave as one group, they have to have the same name. In this case, they're all called radio button. Okay? You could have put whatever, Paul. Whatever you wanted. But they all have to be named the same in order to work as a group. And by working as a group, I mean when you click on one, all of the other ones will be unclicked, unselected. Okay? So that's the first thing. Now, each one will have a different value. So when I select the first one, the value will be CPE, the second one, EPT, etc. Right? Now, this is all part of a form. So when I click on submit the answer, 
I'm actually submitting this form. And this form contains all the inputs, so it's going to take all the inputs and submit it to the server. Now, notice this. This is the name of the form. It's called My Quiz. And when you submit this form, you're going to go to this URL, which, when there's no URL, it defaults onto itself. So it's going to try to post onto itself. And before you submit it, or unsubmit, you go and execute the JavaScript function called check answers. So somewhere in here has got to be a JavaScript function called check answers. Here it is. What do you say? Hey, document, get me the tag called my quiz. What tag is called my quiz? A form tag. Correct? Document, get me an element by ID, call my quiz. Here it is. It will give you the form. It says, here it is. So the entire form is sitting in a variable called my quiz. This guy. And then what do you do? Notice this form. How many inputs does this form have? You guys remember about forms, right? This is going back two weeks ago. Every input in a form will be associated to a name value pair. What's the name? The name of the tag, of the input tag. What's the value? Whatever you key it in. Okay? And all these name value pairs will get posted across the wire to the server. This action will tell you what URL is going to be posted to. In this case, it's going to be posted onto itself. Okay? So, how many input values does this form have? Anybody? If you count on IC six, right? How many input tags does it have? One, two, three, four, five, six. Now, do I care about reset? Not really. Do I care about submit? Other than indicating that I want to submit it? I don't care the value. Do I care about radio button? Now, wait a minute. They're all called radio buttons. So... In reality, how many values am I really posting? I'm posting only one name, radio button. What possible values can I post for that name, radio button? One, two, three, four. I could be posting radio button equals CPE or radio button equals EPT, or radio button equals PERF, okay? So what I'm really posting is only three values, radio button, submit, and reset. The last two I don't care. So what do I do? I tell my quiz, which is my form, hey, among your elements, an element is an array. Notice that the form tag has an array called elements, and inside that array you will find each one of the inputs that are being posted. So among your elements, I'm interested in the one that is sub one. Okay? So this one is sub one. And then you ask whether it's checked or not. Okay, so in this case, which one did we say was the answer? Error prevention tip, right? So this one is sub zero, this one is sub one, this one is sub two. 
Suppose that the the answer is portability tip. Just just for giggles, we're gonna. Do so portability tip is zero one two three. If the answer checked was sub three, means you got the right answer. Otherwise, you got the incorrect answer. So let's refresh it again. You have to refresh it so that it loads the new JavaScript. So now I'm going to say error prevention tip, submit, incorrect answer. I'm going to say portability tip, submit. You got the right answer. Got it? So each one of the input elements in the array will be considered an element in the form. And that's how you can address them. Now, what will be another way of addressing it? Well, you could just ask the document to get you the element uh, radio button and then have a switch based on the value of that element. If it was CPE, you got the incorrect answer. If it was port, you got the correct answer. That's another way of doing it. Or, better yet, like they did it this way. You just go directly to the element of that form and verify whether it was checked or not. Any questions? So, so you're starting to see how JavaScript can manipulate the actual HTML. Not only the HTML, but the properties of the HTML. So that your website behaves differently. It's more dynamic. Okay. Now let's cover some of the objects. And I'm going to just very quickly go through them. Um, <coughs> because there's no time. But you can find... Like I said, on W3Schools, if you go into JavaScript, uh, it's a uh, JavaScript section, right? And then you go into JavaScript and HTML. The, the, the URL is JSREF, J JavaScript Reference. You will see all the JavaScript objects. that we're going to be covering, okay? So one by one, we're going to just cover arrays, we're going to cover dates, strings, etc., etc. So strings. This should be very simple stuff. I mean, this is if you guys have seen C or Java or have done any programming in C or Java, this should be breeze. You have this string zebra and you can say, you know, What's the character at position zero? Or what's the character code at position zero? Okay, or you can generate a string from character codes. These character codes. I mean that's that's stuff, very simple stuff. You know, and again, you can go in into this JavaScript objects reference, go into the string object, and you will see the exact same methods that I'm talking about. Character code at, character at, and if you click on them, you will see a ref, uh, description of what it is and some sample data that you can play with. Um, honestly, the most important ones like index of, to see the index of a substring within a string. Um, split, which you can take a whole split, um, I mean a whole string and split it by a certain character. Like if you have a name equals value pair, you can take the whole string and split it by the equals. Okay. Um, substring. You know, if exactly extract the characters from a string between two specified indexes. So strings between position 1 and position 10, whatever. 
to lowercase to put everything in lowercase or to uppercase to transform it, the entire string into an uppercase. I mean, these are all the different methods that you have available to you to manipulate strings. You know, split and substring, for instance. Uh, see this? Document, get me the element called input value. And input value is an input text box. 60 of uh, 40 characters. So I'm going to type some text in there. What is it going to do? It's going to try to take that input string and split it by the commas. And then it's going to put it into an array of tokens. And then what do you do next? You take each one of the um, tokens array and you're going to join. That's another Talking about arrays. Where is array? Join joins all elements of an array into a string. So that's the opposite of split. So split is a function of this uh, of a string. Split is a function of a string, and join is a function of an array. Right. So what are you doing here? You're taking all the tokens and joining them by this character, which is new line. So if I were to execute this, enter a sentence to split into words. So got it. Okay. There's a lot of stuff that you can do with this. Markup methods, date and time. Look at the stuff that you can do with date and time. I mean, specifying arguments for a new date, get methods for local time zone, and all that stuff. These are all different functions that you have available for the for the um, time object. Okay. So notice you create a new date. Notice that in this case, since you are passing parameters, you're not defaulting it to a specific to, to the now date, right? To the to the machine date. But you're actually specifying the year, the month, the day, the the hour, the minutes, the seconds, all that stuff. Okay? And then you can set a date to a specific date, or you can set the month, or you can set the full year, or you can set the hours. These are all functions of the date object. And again, you want to see all the specifics, just go to W3Schools. Wow, that's a lot of stuff that I've covered. And take a look at the date. Date object. Get hours, get full year, get time milliseconds, all that stuff. UTC, which is the universal time, etc. Okay, so these are the different objects. Window. Window. Look at this window. I'm going to create a new window. It's going to be called a child window, right? And I want a toolbar. What's the toolbar? This is the toolbar. All these buttons. and This is the toolbar in the window. What's the menu bar? This is the menu bar. The scroll bars. The scroll bars are the ones that show up in here when they, it's too wide, or show up in here when it's... I'm sorry. Show up in here when it's too wide, or show up in here when it's too long. Right? And then the Windows URL, which is going to be like, you know, wherever I want to go. And then I'm going to create such a window. So programmatically, I'm creating, and it didn't go to MSN. Programmatically, I'm creating another browser, Firefox browser, with the menu bar, the 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 icon bar. What is it called? The toolbar. And it's not showing the content. I don't know why. But notice, notice this. These buttons were disabled. 
Now they're enabled. So I can modify the child window. I can close it. What is what happens when I click on close? One more browser. So I can actually manipulate the whole Firefox window within JavaScript. Next one, I don't want any menu bars. Notice that it didn't create any menu bars. How do you do that? Notice that you have these buttons. The create button, when you click on it, goes and executes the create child window. Okay? Now, remember, you have these checkboxes. You have the toolbar check box, the menu check, check, and they tell you whether you want that or not. Right? Depending on whether it's being selected or not. What does create child window do? Create child window has three variables, one for each bar, and then you tell the document, hey, give me the element called toolbar checkbox. And I want to know if it's checked. If it's checked, toolbar equals yes. If it's not checked, toolbar equals no. And you do the same thing for the other two um, bars. The menu, the, the scroll bars and the menu bars. And then what do you do? Say, hey window, open a new window. And then you tell it whether you want a toolbar, a menu bar, and a scroll bar. How? You just pass a parameter, a third parameter, which is a long string of what? Toolbar equals yes, or toolbar equals no. Menu bar equals yes, or menu bar equals no. Whatever. And it creates that new window. And it forks it off. So it creates it and continues executing. Now, look what it does. It tells the document, hey, get me the close button. And I know the close button was disabled. How do I know that? Let's take a look at the close button. The close button, disable, disable. So that's why it looked like I couldn't click on it initially. But then what do I do here? Say, document, get me the close button, and then in the disable property, say equals false. So, not disable means enable. That's how you get this button, the close button, to be enabled. You can create. It creates it, and now it's enabled. Click on close. Kills the other window and disable these. How do you accomplish that? Let's take a look at the close button. The close button executes when clicked the close child window. Close child window. What does it do? It takes the child window that we created and we say, if it's closed, you are attempting to interact with the closed window. Somebody else closed it. Okay? But if it's not closed, if it's not true that it's closed, then we say, hey, child window, close. Now, there's a big difference between closed and close. Open paren, close paren. What's the difference? Anybody? Exactly. Closed is a property of a window. Close is a function of a window or a method. Okay? And then notice that this is where you disable it. Close button, disable, true. Okay. Any questions? Either one, the top or the left. Doesn't matter. One of them should stay as cascading style sheets. There are a 
thousand different ways. Yes, I have plenty of examples. Didn't I show you guys examples last week? I thought I did this. What did I do last week? I thought it was in this class. I did a search, a Google on cool JavaScript menus. It's right there. Right? Then I went to the first top, whatever. 13 awesome JavaScript Viscani style sheet menus. These guys give you the styles, the JavaScript, everything that you need. In fact, each one of them have their own page explaining exactly how you can you customize it to your website. Let's take a look at one of these that I saw. You guys remember the Mac and the uh, what is it, the Apple menu? And when you hover over it, it's like the taskbar, right? Or whatever you call the panel. Oh, that's right, yeah. <coughs> Let's see the demo. This is actually in JavaScript. Look, download the source files. Insert the following code. Configure this and that. You want to view the demo? Here's the demo. This is JavaScript. This is JavaScript working. To jump here. Jumps too much, right? No, you put this into the HTML. You put the JavaScript into the HTML. Or, in fact, typically what they do is they do a link. A script. I'm sorry, a script. So you say include jQuery.js and interface.js. So remember when we when we have styles inside in HTML, we had them in what in the header section, right? Well, when you take those styles and put it in a CSS file, what do you do? You have to create a file, whatever name, whatever name that CSS that CSS, and then link it to the page where you want to apply that style. Very similar. All we've been seeing here is HTML pages that have JavaScript inside. What do you do? You take all that JavaScript and you put it in whatever file, whatever, whatever, dot JS. That's a JavaScript file. And then what do you do? You do a script like this. So basically up to this point is the same as what you have in your page. But instead of having the entire JavaScript right there in the page, you just put it in a dot JS file. And then you source and say, okay, the source is going to, you can find it under JS folder slash jQuery.js. Yes. You can use whatever JavaScript you want. No. It has to be self contained, remember. Most probably, it, you can download it. Okay. Um, let's keep on going. Cookies. This is a really interesting one. Cookies. Has anybody seen cookies? How is cookies done? <laughs> well, in in Firefox, which is what I'm using right now, and I suggest you do the same thing. You go ahead and download. There are like a thousand of them, okay? A plugin that allows you to manage your cookies. So if you, I downloaded one called the Cookies Manager, right? And here are all the cookies that I have. So I'm going to select all of them, and I'm going to delete them. Delete all 162 of them, okay? Okay? And then I'm going to run this example. You guys remember this example about good morning when it was uh, before noon and good afternoon and good evening. This is the exact same 
example, except that now it's prompting me for my name. Please enter your name. So, and it defaults to Paul. So I say, okay, this is my name. Okay. Click OK. All right. Good evening. Alvaro Escobar, welcome to JavaScript programming. And then I refresh it. In fact, I close it, come back. It doesn't ask for my name. It automatically knows that it's me. In fact, I close the browser, okay, and then come back to the page. It's going to take a little while. Hard drive is chugging like crazy. And he knows my name. How did that happen? Because initially, remember, I clear all my cookies. Then I went into the page and prompt for my name. Somehow the JavaScript must have saved my name locally. Okay? And locally means something different depending on what type of browser you use. Firefox means it's being saved on a SQLite database. Stanford University. I think it's doing the con. Sorry about that. <laughs> I was watching this. This guy is really cool. This guy has managed to create thousands of videos, YouTube videos, that can. It's a 10 minute video that teaches you algebra, math, biology, calculus. And he did this for free for years. It's free! I mean, you can actually go ahead and... Anyway, he got sponsored finally, and he's doing this for a living. So it's it's really awesome, because a lot of people are really learning stuff, and this is the way that education should be, at least in the future. That's what it's going to be. You know, using technology to rethink how we teach and learn. That's the way it should be. And, yeah, go to Khan Academy, and you can see his, his, his homepage has 6,000 links, so don't get that idea, okay? That's not a very good idea for you. has 6,000 links. Each link is a YouTube video that he created explaining each one of these subjects. Okay? The guy takes a whole week and immerses himself into the subject, asks professors, asks graduate students, reads books, and then does a 10-minute video on the subject. And it's it has been proven that, you know, when we learn, we take really very small time frames to <laughs> of attention. You know, 10 minutes, 8 minutes to 10 minutes is already lost your attention. <laughs> anyway, so cookies. How did it? How did this? How did I get this uh, uh, greeting, Alvaro Escobar? Well, in the case of Firefox, it's a it's a MySQL. It's a it's a very small footprint of MySQL database called SQLite. That's what Firefox uses to download and organize all the images, the cascading style sheets, the JavaScript, the cookies, everything. Okay? That's why you need like a tool, like a plugin to be able to. But if you do it in Firefox, Firefox has everything under. And you probably have guys have seen this. Documents and settings under the user that you log in as, right? Alvaro in my case, local settings, temporary internet files. This folder contains absolutely everything that Internet Explorer down downloads from other web from the web servers. Images, cascading style sheets, JavaScript, videos, etc. etc. Everything. In fact, if you go to a website and they seem to have some audio music protector, whatever, and you listen to it, it actually streams it down and creates a file in your temporary, and then you can copy and paste that file somewhere else, and then you got that. <laughs> you didn't hear from me, okay? All right, so in here, it will create cookies as well. Okay, in fact, have you guys, are you guys familiar with the 